and turn from their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Go a little bit. See, I didn't bring my clicker. All right, let's say this together. This is much bigger than politics. We are in a crisis at river, or in a crisis as a nation. We need God to intervene, no matter how our political viewpoint. Let us join together and see God. As us, as Christians, we even though we might all see all the politics the same, might not all vote the same. If they see us arguing, we've lost our foot. We've lost our foot. We've got to keep on going forward. And if we don't.
We don't want to go on here. There it is. Offer, offer yourself to God is what worship is all about. Amen? We've been offering our love and we've offered our words and we've offered our praise. Now it's time to give our time and our offering. So we're going to worship again. Get ready. Get your, get your offering out. Put it in your hand. If you haven't already, put it in the back. Put it in your hand. If you've already put it in the back, then hold up your hand. And you can put it in the back on the way back if you haven't yet. Ready? Now say this together. I lift my offering to you. Let it please you, O oh Lord. This is my seed. I will release my hand. It will never leave my life. You will multiply. Accept my seed, O oh Lord. Isn't God going to give me a hand clap? Praise the Lord, saints. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Does anybody have an outspoken request this morning? Uplifted hands, special needs, lost loved ones. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the time and opportunity, Father, for to be here, Lord God, and to draw close unto you. And you said in your word, if we draw nigh unto you, you would draw nigh unto us. And draw close this morning to each and every one of us, Lord. You see our needs, you know our hearts. Supply those according to your riches and glory, Father, the testimony would be given, Lord. Be sure to give you glory, honor, and praise for it all. Be with us in the remainder of this service, Lord God. Draw us, Lord God, as we hear your word that you've delivered. Our pastor, Lord God, anoint him to bring forth the way you would have us say it, Lord God, and prepare our hearts to receive. And Father, we'll be sure to give you glory, honor, and praise for it all. In Christ Jesus' name, church said.
God is awesome all the time. Today is the last day that you're going to be depressed ever. Wouldn't it be cool? <laughs> Wouldn't that be so awesome if today was the last day that you'd ever be depressed? We're going to talk over, we're talking about Elijah. Next week, unless something changes, next week we're going to start on the armor. Okay? The armor of God in spiritual warfare. But today, we want to go ahead and we're going to finish up. Wasn't that beautiful music today? Amen. Glory. It was really special when she jumped on that piano, too. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory, glory to the Lamb. I'm sorry. I just, I, I just washed my tongue, and I can't do a thing with it. <laughs> First Kings, chapter 19. First Kings, chapter 19. We've got him in the wilderness. Now we're going to get him out. Elijah, one of the greatest men of God that ever lived, so powerful that when Jesus came on the scene, they said that when John the Baptist came, he would have the spirit of Elijah. So this is very, very, very powerful how God works in our lives and how God can take the greatest man and show us all his wrinkles, his blemishes, his freckles, his mess-ups, so that we can know that, honestly, no matter how perfect you think you are, you can still mess up. Look at somebody, look at somebody and say, you can still mess up. <clears throat> You ain't got to say, look, don't, don't ask him this, but it'd be cool if you could look at him and say, have you messed up today? <laughs> Amen. God's good all the time. God is good. <clears throat> Let's go ahead. <clears throat> uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So that the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, you get an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, buddy. You kill my guys, I'm going to kill you. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Bathsheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey to the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. Now he's running for his life. This is how people get when they get depressed. He's running because he thinks he's going to be killed and when he stops running for a few minutes to rest, he says, God, kill me. Crazy, isn't it? And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, the angel touched him and said, Arise unto him, rise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water in his head, hand, or at his head. And when he had eaten and drank and laid down again, the angel of the Lord came the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for this journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went through the strength of that mountain forty days and forty nights under the hair of the mount of the Lord. When he came thither into the cave and lodged there, behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What has caused you to be in the mental, physical, spiritual predicament that you're in? And I want to do something for you today about it. When I talked about, just then was reading about the angel. The angel came unto him. 
and touched him. As I spoke that, I honestly felt angels in this congregation reaching out to touch people today, to lift them up, to do something special. You need to put your receivers up because it's here. He's here. His angels are here. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. We know, God, that you are alive and well, and you are on your throne. I ask you right now, God, to minister, Lord, in a way only you can. Touch us, God, in a very powerful way. Help nothing be help us, Lord, that let nothing be said through strife or vain glory, but let everything be said for the edification of your body and for the glorification of your Son. We thank you, God, for all that you do and all that you've already done and what you're doing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Y'all are already seated, most of you. <laughs> now you can be, the rest of you can be seated. Amen. <clears throat> I remember when I was a younger guy, I called my mama, and I was excited because I had just met the woman of my dreams. I said, now what should I do? My mother had an idea. Why don't you send her flowers and on the card invite her to the, your apartment for a home-cooked meal? I thought it was a great strategy and a week later, she came to the dinner. My mother called the next day and said, how did things go? And I, I said, I was totally humiliated. She insisted on washing the dishes. Mama said, what's wrong with that? I said, because we hadn't started eating yet. <laughs> that one crashed hard. Bam! Mark that one down. Never use. Throw away the book. Throw away the page, not the book. The page, throw away the page. All right. Now we're going to talk about, I've got, got a good throwing. I'm going to bring it all the way up to date for those that have not been here for the whole Elijah journey. So there'll be a few slides from each one that we're going into today, how God got him out of it. Because remember, remember, God wants us to be ready for spiritual warfare. Jesus said to occupy until he comes does not mean to take up space. Amen? Does not mean that you just fill a pew. To occupy till he comes means to, it's, a, it's a military term. It means to be productive. It means to take back that which has been taken from us. And remember this, we just, this is where we're going to be going next week with the armor. Uh, ready? Uh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen? So now, here it goes. We're getting ready to, for the last few weeks. Here's some slides. It's going to bring us back up to this time right now. <clears throat> something I want everybody to understand in here is that every one of us are warriors not warriors warriors some of us are both amen can you say instead of saying mighty warrior saying I'm the worry warrior God has called all of us to step up to the plate and take care of business we got to understand, too, it's very important. That's why church is so important. That's why God's Word is so important. I can't fight Satan on what somebody told me. I can't fight Satan on my grandmama's old spiritual remedies. I've got to see the Word of God for myself because it's a personal battle. And I've got to know what God's saying to me. I don't have to just have His logos. I need His rhema word. His rhema word is a fresh word for what you're in your circumstance. But all this spiritual warfare is fault. is always fault on a different realm. And so when it's fault... It's amazing how after you come through a spiritual battle, how you can be totally drained. Anybody ever fought a spiritual battle and been totally drained? Okay? The reason it's totally drained is because it takes a toll on you, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. So, because it takes a toll on us, it's important that, number one, we're aware of that. We've got to know that it can happen to anybody, even Elijah. We've got to know also we've got to be active, finding ways to keep ourselves on board, to keep ourselves from getting from falling on our face always have something ready and always working some way and also we need to be attuned because when it happens we got to know that things are going on so elijah has called everybody to spiritual warfare elijah was called to spiritual warfare and god has called us to a life of spiritual warfare so here it is is that any y'all has there ever been y'all you're running on empty you, you give it all you got 
You're running on empty. Matter of fact, here, here's the little thing I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. Have you gone as far as you can go? Have you taken all that you can take? Have you given all that you can give? Wow. Welcome to running on empty. I know a lot of strong Christians that although you might not see it, they're running on empty. A lot of times it's because other people are depending so much on you that either they lax their hold or they don't fight, and you're fighting not only for you, but you're fighting for you. Somebody besides you, you're fighting for your household, you're fighting for your workmates, whoever it is, <clears throat> and it can take such a toll, although the people might not see it. They might not even be able to tell it. But you find yourself, you're trying everything you can to hold it together, but you find yourself mentally, physically, spiritually exhausted. And when you get here, it is so easy to get depressed. Now, there's all kinds of depression. Now, there's acute depression. There's chronic depression. There's clinical depression. There's situational depression. Uh, there's, uh, there, there is uh, 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 a relational uh, depression. So there's all kinds of depression. But when you find yourself like this, you can get yourself depressed. And it's very important that we understand that God has got something special for us. And that's watch this. Here's Elijah. We talked about it last week. Here's Elijah. He is running on empty. Have you ever rode down the road and saw that on your gas tank? Usually when that happens, there's not a gas tank or not a gas station around. Right. Yeah. The dummy light didn't dummy me fast enough. Alright. Okay. So, so, so you remember the other week I talked about the nuns, the nuns had run out of gas, they had nowhere, the gas station was down the road, they had nowhere else, to, nothing else to put the gas in, so they carried some bed pans with them, and they filled up the big, big can, the bed pans with gas, and they come back and were pouring up from the gas in their car from the bed pan, and the guy rode by, and the other guy said, no, that's faith. <laughs> <laughs> So, running on empty. First, he was running on a feeling. The Bible says he'd gone in. He had, he had rebuilt the altar of God. He had challenged 850 prophets. He had, he had rebuilt that altar. He had called down fire from heaven. And then, after he called fire down from heaven and got everybody else's uh, on the same page, then he goes out and kills the prophets, and he runs back on the, on the mountain seven times to pray for rain. So, he, he, he's running on feelings right now. He's running on emotions. I see people... <coughs> All the time. And I might say, look, you need to sit down. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I said, you really need to sit down, take a deep breath, go get you some water, go get you a drink, go get some coffee, do something. And they go, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I said, yeah, but right now you're running on feelings. You're running on emotions, especially in the death. You're running on emotions. And if you're not careful when you run on emotions, pretty soon you're just going to be on autopilot. And you get on autopilot and crazy things happen. Okay? So first he was running on feelings. Then he was running on fear because now spiritual love because Jezebel says, I'm killing you within 24 hours. For all you've done against my guys, I'm going to kill you. And she's supposed to be one of God's people. And so here's, here, have you ever seen the church kill their, <laughs> kill their people? All right. So, so here we go. So now he's running on fumes, pure spiritual exhaustion. He's gone into the desert, and he's gone until he sees this ju juniper tree, which is supposed to be, could be an oasis, and it's in this spiritual oasis that maybe, just maybe he can get some refreshment, but there's really nothing there. He's left everybody behind. He's all by himself. So now, here, here's, we talked about the depression of, or, or the symptoms of depression. Let me just read these again. I can't see them from up there. Thoughts of death, uh, tiredness and lack of energy, angry outburst, uh, no concentration, loss of interest, feelings of sadness, reduced appetite or increased appetite, and sleep uh, disturbances, which means either you can't sleep at all or you can't wake up, one or the other. So, so this is what happens when somebody starts getting depressed, and many times you're already experiencing half of those symptoms before you actually stop and realize that you're depressed. 
You're already there. And you're going, uh, Pastor, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. And I say, I know why you're feeling this way. You're depressed. You know, you got to understand. This is part of what, what, what I told you to begin. you got to understand what the symptoms are. Understand what's going on. And know that you can get it too. There's nobody in here that can is totally, totally got slick 50 on them and depression will never hit them. It's just different types of depression, different different levels of depression, but anybody can be depressed. So here's Elijah's tank. Elijah, uh, when, when, after he did all this famous work for the Lord, he changed his focus. He ceased to walk by faith. The Bible said when he saw that, when he built that altar, when he challenged those prophets, when he prayed for rain, when he outrun the chariots 18 miles, he was running by, or seeing by faith. But once he heard, he was totally exhausted from his spiritual warfare. And when Jezebel gave him the threat, the Bible said that when he saw that, she threatened him. There's a couple of things to that. Number one, when he saw that, also he could have been watching her military start to pile up to go get him. Maybe been walking around knocking on doors trying to find him so he had to leave the area. So he changed his focus from walking by faith to walking by sight. Have you ever done that? <coughs> he changed his force from boldness to fear. He arose. He stood up against 850 prophets and now he's running for one woman. I'm a refrain from any kind of jokes now on account that I might get hurt. Yeah, see, I got so nervous when I said it, I dropped my piece of candy. Amen. It got good. <laughs> he changed his feelings. He became depressed. He goes and finds that juniper tree in the desert and he just sits there and says, God, kill me. I know nobody in here has ever said, God, kill me. Nobody has ever said, God, I wish I was never born. Mm. Have, you ain't got to raise your hands. But have you ever said that? Oh, God, I'd be better off dead. Oh, oh my friends and family would be better off if I was dead. where you're at. So now, here it is. I really believe <clears throat> at this time, at this hour, either here or on Facebook Live or later on YouTube, <clears throat> there's many people that that's their life slogan. I got nothing left. Nothing. I played by the rules. I crossed all my T's. I dotted all my I's. I did everything I believe God required of me. And still. He came. I thought I heard from you, God. I thought I got it under control with you, God. We got this. And you find out you ain't got this. And right now your motto, your slogan, the way you feel inside is, I got nothing left, God. Nothing. If you're not there today, you may have been there. And if you're not there, have not been there, I promise you, you'll get there one day. I got nothing left. Now how did God get Elijah beyond this? What did God do with Elijah to help him through this time? You see, what happens is when we get feeling this way, we think God has forsaken us. We think God is not really worried about us. It's, you see him doing for somebody else, but he's not doing for you. You think... Well, I saw God working for this family last week, and I saw God working for this guy when he was in the same situation. But where are you now, God? And you're thinking that God doesn't see, God doesn't hear, 
God doesn't understand, I'm here to tell you that God never took his eye off you. Not one time. He never took his hand off of you. God loves you. So what happened? The very first thing. Fresh provision. Let's, let's just read this. And he lay and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, then an angel touched him. And said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals. And a cruise of water at his head. And when he did eat and drink, and he laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him. Y'all say the second time. He said, Arise and eat, for this journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and then went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Herod, the mount of God. How many of you ever heard of restorative sleep? If it's possible when somebody's really, really upset, and doctors will do this, if somebody's really upset, the doctor will give you a sedative. Why does the doctor give you a sedative? It's not so you're going to be quiet, not aggravate everybody. That's not what he's giving it to you for. He says, let me help you. I remember when, I remember, I hear that I've told it before that night, or that when the doctor come and told me for four days and four nights, you can lose your wife and your daughter at any, any time, either one of them or both of them at any time. And they kept saying, let us give you something to help you sleep. And I kept telling, no, I don't need that. I got somebody that helps me sleep. I got somebody that helps me handle this. And he made me promise with tears in his eyes, made me promise if you get in a bind, you come see me because you need some sleep. What's restored to sleep? Now I'm going to do a little bit of, a little bit of counseling and stuff, just a little bit. Because God is the king of psychology. He's the one that wrote it. How many of you ever gone to Walmart at 9 or 10 o'clock at night and you sell these shopping carts? up at the front desk, and they're full of all kinds of items, just full of items. Just full. Nothing matches, it's just a bunch of items. And then they call out, I think it's called pickup or boxing or whatever it is, I can't, it's not boxing, but they call the crowd, and guys come and pick up these, these, these carts, and they go and they put them back where they belong, because this is stuff they found in the wrong place. So they go find stuff in the wrong place and they put them in this cart, push it to the front, the other guys come and pick up the cart and go put them in the right place. And then make it nice and neat so when you grab one thing, two things fall out. During the day, especially when you're depressed, under a lot of pressure, you're like Walmart, on the shelf, there's stuff on the shelf that don't belong there. There's stuff on the shelf been knocked over. There's stuff in the floor. So it's like a mess. And when you go to sleep at night and get a good, good, deep sleep, what happens is, and then even in REM sleep, God, in all his mercy, takes all those shopping carts and he puts everything back in the right place. When you went to bed, you were scrambled brained. I can't think! You know why? It's because everything's off the shelf in the wrong spot. Like uh, 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 defragging a computer. But once you go to sleep and get a good night's sleep, you somebody say, let me, let, let, me, let me sleep on it. And wake up in the morning, God, I got the idea, got what you need. is because while you were asleep, God in all of his mercy designed us so that when we go to sleep, all the carps, or put in the right spot. And when you wake up, your brain is back in shape to do what it needs for the coming day. And if you don't sleep, you see people that won't get insomnia or don't sleep and don't sleep and don't sleep and don't sleep, what happens? They do some crazy, crazy, crazy things. 
We've seen people when they go postal and they find out, well, he didn't sleep for the last three nights. God was like this with Elijah. I want you to lay down. I want you to sleep. But not only lay down and sleep, but I'm going to send refreshment while you sleep. So watch this. He recuperated. He slept. Then he ate. God rose him up and then said, eat. Now he re-energizes. He says, you still ain't got enough. Go back to sleep. He goes back to sleep, recuperates, recuperates sleep, and then he's energized again. God does four things under that juniper tree. I promise you tonight, today, that if your life is about to drive you crazy, and you haven't been able to sleep and everything's on the wrong shelf. Let God do that with you. Try sleeping. I don't mean just sleep to be sleeping. I mean when you sleep, say, God, when I lay down, God, you said you'd give me rest, that you would restore me. I thank you for this sleep. I thank you for this rest. And you rest. And then when you get up, you eat something. And then if you need to, go back to sleep. And then get back up and eat something. Get yourself ready because what's coming... When it comes, it needs your full attention. So, God was restoring him physically. He prepared him food and gave him rest. God was also restoring him spiritually. How many, until I just told you that God does the same thing, how many even realize that when you sleep and all this stuff gets put back on the shelf where it's supposed to be, God's preparing you spiritually for what you need to do before you. Because now you can think. It's very important. God was propelling him to go to Mount Horeb. He was just going to go in the desert and die. And God said, no, nope, you're not going to lay under this tree and die. I need you to get up because you ain't through yet. I'm here to tell some of you right now, you ain't through yet. Look at somebody and tell them, you ain't through yet. Tell somebody, you ain't through yet. God's got something for you. Next. A, fe a fresh profession. He says, okay, Elijah. What are you doing here? Of course, God sent him 40 days later. He's there. But God sent him there so he could ask him this question. He had to help him to get his mind back right so he could even answer the question. And he came hither in the cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous. For the Lord of hosts, Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altar, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left. He still ain't got it. God's been taken care of. He stands up on the mountain and starts singing, How great I am! How great I am! I'm the only one. When you get depressed, if you're not careful, you will get a false humility. A false humility is actually pride. And you're thinking you're the only one that's even going through this. You don't fall for that. Do not fall for this. Do not fall for it. Satan is trying to take you down. Do not fall for this. He said, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And the great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces of rocks before the Lord. For the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Wow. <coughs> what are you doing here? God knew that he needed to unload. Man, he needed to unload. 
He was so full of what had been happening to him that he got his wrong perspective. He got everything wrong. He began to think he was the only one going through any trouble, that he was the only one that ever stood up for God. I mean, he was so messed up in his thinking because of that depression. He needed to look to the proper person, God, the proper way on the mount of God. And we need to talk to God about what we're going through. And then we need to find somebody we can trust to talk it out. Somebody we can trust, and when you tell them they're not going to take it and blow it out of proportion, or they're not going to take it out and make people like a bad guy, or they're going to take it and use it against you. So, that's part of what I do as a pastor counselor, uh, a pastoral counselor, is you can talk to me, and I promise it's not going anywhere. But if you've got a friend you can talk to this, don't go talk to If you're having a marriage problem, don't go talk to a single person. If you're having a spiritual problem, don't go talk to a heathen. When I don't know what kind of bass strings to buy, I go to D.C. Don't know, son. When I was going to get the, the, my wireless, what did I tell you? Tell me what you think is the best. I went to my life the best to find out the best thing to do. Amen? If my car was running bad, I did not go to Bethany. Bless her heart, she was beautiful and she was full of love. But she, the only thing she knew with the car was wreck it. If I wanted my car wrecked, here Bethany, take the keys. One day I let her drive, because somebody had to let her drive so she could get her license. <laughs> right now at 17, they're working on the road. And I said, the man's holding up a flag, Bethany. She goes, I'll see you. And I said, well, do you think, you know what that flag means? She said, well, I think I should stop. I said, I don't think. And that poor man, bless his heart, he grabbed his flag, and he held it up and he went. <laughs> By the time she got in the food line, as soon as we got in the parking lot, I said, stop the car. She said, but Daddy, we got a long ways to go. I said, stop the car. So said, Daddy, I got it. I said, stop the car. She said, now what do you do, Daddy? I still run. I said, I don't care. Just get out. And I stopped the car right there in the parking lot. I don't know where it was at. And I put it in the park and I said, thank you, God. And she was outside saying, I said, just go in the food line. I'll find you. So if you needed my car work done, I didn't go to Bethany. Find somebody that you can talk to that's going to really be able to help you. If nothing else, a good listener that can keep their mouth shut. Amen? So now, fresh perspective. Again, what you doing here? He showed, God showed him that he not, doesn't always do it the same way. There's two kind of people in this world. There's go-to people, and there's know-it-alls. I ask God all the time, help me not to be a know-it-all, help me be a go-to person. A go-to person, you can get good advice, they can help you, a know-it-all, they're not going to let you even talk. They're just going to tell you. No matter what the subject, they can tell you something. So God's moving. And somebody will tell you, Lord, I'll tell you, well, God don't do it that way. I'm here to tell you something. If God's speaking to you and it does not violate his word, listen. All you got to listen. You got that compass, the word of God. If it does not violate that word, you listen because God's talking. 
So he showed me that always does always communicate the same way. He showed him that his that his own perspective, Elijah's perspective, was wrong. He showed him that he still had a group of people that he could trust and realize there's more to it than you actually see. I think I tell that to people more than anything else he is. I know it seems like the world is falling apart around you, but there's more to this. And God's doing more. Matter of fact, C.S. Lewis was the one that wrote this. God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. We gotta trust him. We gotta trust him. Then a fresh purpose. I'm getting ready to close. I said getting ready. We also sing I'm getting ready of this world. We ain't gone yet, have we? And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the will. I'm gonna finish reading up here and and after the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire was a small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped himself in his mantle, went out and stood in the, stood into the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, Elijah, what you doing here? Ask him again. And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord and for the forsaken covenant. And here we go, having that same conversation, but now God's doing it a whole different way. The Lord says unto him, Go return thou, to wait to the Damascus, in the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. So he's still working. I got stuff like I want stuff for you to do. And anoint Jehu the son of Nimshai, show you anoint to be king over Israel, and Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abiel Mehola. Sometimes I think putting on phonics don't even work on some of these things. That thou shalt not be prophet in your room. In other words, you got some people to anoint, you got some people to train. Go take care of the kingdom work, physical work. Go take care of my work, the spiritual. You know that Elijah ministered to Elijah 10 years? He was thinking he was going to die. And God used him for ten more years. God weren't through with him. And I promise you, God's not through with you. You know, you got to understand that although there's only one anointing, God anoints us over and over. And over and over again. And God will use us to pass on that anointing. Get ready. Sit down talking to somebody. You decide if you want to get back up. You decide if this is the last chapter in your life. You don't have to be defined by your situation. It's time to get up. Now, I've got my famous, famous, famous theologian who wants to talk to y'all today. Let's see if I can get it working here. You know, what we do has been this. People see me, but they think of you. Now with all this going on, this is going to be worse than ever. You're going to have to be. You know, sure it does. Why you got a lot going on, kid? Well, my last name? That's the reason I got a decent job. That's the reason why people deal with me in the first place. Now I start to get a little ahead. I start to get a little something for myself. And this happens. Now I'm asking you as a favor not to go through this, okay? This is only going to end up bad for you. This is going to end up bad for me. You think I'm hurting you? Yeah, in the way you are. It's the last thing I ever wanted to do. I know that's not what you want to do, but that's just the way that it is. Don't you care what people think? Doesn't it bother you that, that people are making you have to be a joke? And then I'm going to be included in that? Do you think that's right? Do you? You ain't going to believe this. Will you just sit right here? I don't 
Come on, you just take your mother. This kid's gonna be the best kid in the world. This kid's gonna be somebody better than anybody ever knew. And you grew up good and wonderful. It was great just watching every day. It was like a privilege. And the time come for you to be your own man and take on the world, and you did. But somewhere along the line, you changed. You stopped being you. You let people stick a finger in your face and tell you you're no good. And when things got hard, you started looking for something to blame. Like a big shadow. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, you are nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But you gotta be willing to take the hits and not point fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. Conversation with God. Matter of fact, when I watched that movie and that started playing, I thought about the times I stood in my prayer closet and had a similar conversation with my Heavenly Father. How many have ever heard? of a boxer named James Corbett. In the 1800s, James Corbett. He wrote something. And I've got it here. I want, us to, I want to read it to you. Let me find it. They asked James Corbett. Now back when he was fighting, it was different. They would stand toe-to-toe -to -toe without gloves. And they would fight each round till somebody fell, and that was a round. And they kept going until the person fell and never got back up. The longest bout on record is from 1893. It went 110 rounds. And the winner stayed in the hospital six weeks. The winner broke every bone in his hand. They asked James Corbin, another champion boxer, how do you do this? And of course, the World Boxing Federation came in. They changed the rules. Now it's down maybe 12 rounds, maybe 15 rounds, depends if a championship or not. And they wear they had to wear certain kind of gloves. And when they're practicing, they have to wear headgear. There's all kinds of stuff and mouthpieces. Here's what he said. He said, how, do you, how have you been champion for so long with these 50, 100 round fights, toe to toe? How have you been so successful for so long? And he said, this was his philosophy. Fight one more round. When your feet are so tired, you have to shuffle back to the center of the ring. Fight one more round. When your arms are so tired that you can hardly lift your hands to come, come on guard. Fight one more round. When your nose is bleeding and your eyes are black and you are so tired you wish your opponent would crack you one across the jaw and put you to sleep, fight one more round. Remembering that the man who always fights one more round is never whipped. And I'm here to tell you today, to all y'all, you got another round left in you. You do. So why does God allow us to get to this point? I, I did part of this last week, but I'm finishing it today. Number one, it points to the power of the cross. We all need God's help. We all need God's help. 
Number, Number two, it brings the message of grace and mercy to life. Now it's personal. I need God's grace. I need God's mercy. I need Him bad. The prompts reliance upon Him and others. I just can't do this by myself. There's no, no, you heard about what really happened to the Lone Ranger, don't you? The Lone Ranger actually died. Shot by his own bullet. There's no Lone Ranger. It shows us and others that we can still be used even when the worst of situations have taken over. And the greatest of all, when we get in this spot where we got nothing left, nothing, as a child of God, because God knows the end of the story. Elijah had nothing left, but he thought it was over. And he had ten more years, very productive years, very strong years. And when he went out of here, he didn't go out of here like normal people do, being taken out by an undertaker. He was pulled up by a chariot of fire and a whirlwind. When we get to this point, it challenges us. Get back up. Stand up. You show up. There are three entirely different things. I see people get by a cup but not stand up. I see people stand up but not show up. That's what God challenges us to do when we get like feeling like everything's gone and everything's taken away and we've got nothing left. God needs His church to be the church, especially now. The world has gone absolutely crazy. 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 And some of the stuff people are fighting for now makes absolutely no sense. None. And there's so much that's happening that's not even biblical. It's against God's rules and God's laws. And people are pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And making out with home. man says it's okay. No. God's got to say it's okay. Did you see get me to play something, son? I'm leaving you with this. Everybody stand up. He gives power to the faint and weary, and to him who has no might, he increases strength, causing it to multiply. And make it into a mound. Even you shall faint and be weary, and, and uh, selected young men shall feebly stumble and fall, exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord, who expect, who look for, and hope in Him, shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift up their wings and mount up close, close to God as eagles mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint and become tired. How many go down to Hodges stretch a lot? There's that old catfish farm, and then that catfish farm. I'm not even sure if it's even doing it anymore, but there was eagles up in those trees. And you could always tell you saw the birds flying around and doing their thing. But you could always tell when it was a really, really, really bad storm coming. Because all the other birds would be, would be gone. And the eagle would be up flying above the storm. Soaring on the power of that wind that was being generated from that storm. Just soaring. All the other birds hid running for their life and there's the eagle soaring 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 I love this scripture because it says we can be like the eagle I don't know about you, but I want to be 
like me. And when things are going bad, ride the wind and soar. You know you're doing it when somebody comes to you when you're going through things. You go, how are you doing this? How are you even standing up now? How can you even handle this? It's because you're riding on the wind of the storm. Above the storm, like the eagle. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I know there's plenty of things in life that we can look at and be upset about. There's so many things in this life that can take our joy, steal our joy. There's so many things in this life that we might look at and say it's unfair. But I promise you, God has a different calculator. God has a different plan. God can do more in one instant than we can do in a lifetime. We gotta trust his plan. We gotta trust him. He wants to send his angel to your pew. The angel's already here. He wants to send his angel to your pew to strengthen you today. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you're here today and you're not sure about where you stand with God or you know you need to be closer when nobody's looking around, every eye closed, you could just put your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. I, I need to be closer. I need to be closer. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, bless them, bless them. Maybe you're here today and the storms in your life the threats like Jezebel did Elijah he did all this stuff and he was fine and one little threat which weren't so little but one thing one thing after all the things he encountered one thing got to him some of y'all here right now you put up with a lot you've done a lot you've helped a lot but it's been that one thing and it's got you. God wants to touch you today. And let you know His hand is on you and your life. And He's got something powerful still in store. And if you can just learn how to trust Him. I want everybody right now to put that hand up. Put the hand, put both of them up. Put those hands up. DC didn't know what I was doing today. I didn't know what DC was doing. Well, I did know because it's in the hip time. But we didn't coordinate with this. That here's my cup, fill it up, Lord. The Holy Spirit picked that song, not me or DC. DC, play that song again, please. I want us to sing that. And let that angel touch you right now and refill you and give you what you need. And in the name of Jesus. Go ahead, put his hands up. We're good. If you want to sing, sing. 
You just want to bask in this present, bask, but here he is. Here's my cup, Lord. Come on, sing it. I lift it up, Lord. Come on, sing it. Some of y'all are getting it. Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Let them feel your power, your anointing. And God, those that are in their strong battles right now, Lord, they're suffering battle fatigue. Touch them, God, in the name of Jesus. Touch them. Let the Holy Spirit minister in a way that they have not felt in years. And we thank you for that, God. And we thank you, God, that you have the power and the ability to do what we need done in our lives. Touch us right now, Lord. Touch it and remove that battle fatigue. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God is so awesome. Man, that was awesome, awesome, awesome. If you can keep on playing, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. Now that we say the Lord's Prayer, I'm going to ask Brother Steve to dismiss us in prayer. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us